Excellent, thank you. It's good to be here. And it's actually, yeah, it's a long time since I gave a, a talk at the SCTE back in, uh, probably back at around 2000, um, when I was still involved in the, uh, the cable industry. So what I'm gonna um, talk about, let's just get this driven forward, is um, a little bit about the fiber telco revolution that's happening. I call it a revolution because it's, uh, it's the biggest thing that's happened in the telecom space, as far as I'm concerned, for the last uh, 25 years since I got involved in uh, the early days of the cable industry. Um, <clears throat> a little bit of, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be a presentation without a bit of background on um, the, uh, the importance of gigabit and how uh, open reach, how uh, the cable industry and how the alt uh, providers are developing that uh, infrastructure alongside uh, the, uh, the rollout of 5G. Um, I'm gonna go back to how it all started. Um, and that uh, was around the time I joined Sky uh, in 2013. Uh, and then life building out a, a fiber telco, which hasn't been plain sailing. Um, and uh, everything that Gillian said, uh, I've, I've kind of lived and breathed that uh, the coalface to some extent is actually worse out there on PIA than uh, than maybe uh, most people are aware of. Um, and then we talk about uh, building up a brand and the challenges as the, uh, the industry has completely overbuilt itself. It's, it's not been plain sailing. The idea of building fiber was to put in an infrastructure, the idea of overbuilding all of the companies that are supposed to be doing the same thing as you seems uh, crazy and counterproductive, but that's, uh, that's the world we're in at the moment. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, what Fiber UK looks like, which will lead into Shivani's presentation um, about what next for the industry industry as well. So a bit about my background, um, as, as 30 years ago, that sounds scary. Uh, I was involved in, uh, with Telewest, I was Director of Technology, so I ran the UK HFC Network Engineering, launched Blue Yonder with a great team, and also took on Sky to get digital TV launched. So it was, the cable industry in the 90s was the most exciting place to be, and I still look back fondly on that as being the best time of my career. Everything was uh, up for grabs. Everything was, a, uh, you know, there, there was nothing stopping the cable industry in terms of the things that they wanted to achieve. It was a really good time. But I left to go to the dark side. I joined a DSL company. Um, but again, it was because I wanted to get involved in a startup. The dot-com boom was happening. Um, and uh, Bulldog Communications um, came out of a, a US CEO who wanted to... Uh, do local loop unbundling, but not at a retail level, at a wholesale level for all of those companies that wanted to access BT's uh, copper network. So that was eventually sold to cable and wireless after four years, but that was a really good uh, introduction to life <coughs> in a startup, especially as the dot-com bust happened uh, just after the first round of funding for Bulldog. So the, the, fun, the business case for Bulldog changed uh, significantly during the, uh, the, uh, the early stages of that company. After Bulldog, I had various roles in Europe and the Middle East with uh, a number of telecoms companies. Got into consultancy by chance, and it's something that you have to dr extract yourself from. Um, but uh, during, the, during those years, I also did a, got involved in a number of startups. Um, not all of them went well, but it's good to have scars. Um, and uh, I, uh, the last uh, company before setting up Box was a music telecoms com uh, company that... Uh, was put in place to provide uh, media services to telco. So it was a music platform, but uh, we got bumped by, um, by um, God, my mind's gone blank. Who's the big, uh, Spotify. Spotify took the market and uh, that was a, another um, journey through uh, disruptors, um, taking what you thought was a, a pretty good market. No one actually wanted to buy services off their cable operator or off their mobile operator, they wanted an OTT service. So uh, the market changed rapidly. I joined Sky. The reason I joined Sky was because Sky wanted to um, look at whether they continue to spend uh, a significant amount of money with open reach, um, given that they had 6 million broadband customers, or whether they should look at building their own fiber networks. So this was back in 2013. And there were certain catalysts for that. Um, and I'm, I'm not talking out of turn if I say that, uh, you know, BT were not putting the money that was being pumped into them by those that were using the open reach network back into uh, open reach to build fiber networks. It was going back into group. And, uh, you know, when, uh, when BT won the Champions League um, by paying three times the amount of money that it was up for three years earlier, um, that irked Sky a little bit, and they thought, actually, we're just, we're just funding content wars here. Um, so we'll look at 
you know, the opportunities to build our own fiber networks. So we ran at that for about four years. We had the, a huge financial model, uh, OPEX versus CAPEX, how the CAPEX uh, could be uh, financed uh, off balance sheet. Uh, we looked at, um, we did nine trials around the UK. Not everyone's aware of them, but one of them ended up being the Yorkshire trial between with Talk Talk, which ended up getting spun off. And I think it's owned by City Fiber now. So it was all about the economics of build. We even put in our own telegraph poles in some areas, which didn't please residents, but it gave us the feedback we needed not to do that anymore. Um, and yeah, it was great. We had a, we had a great financial model, um, but uh, Sky decided not to pursue that. Uh, OpenReach got uh, logically separated from group. <coughs> And uh, I stepped out of Sky around the time that uh, Comcast uh, were, were buying. I spent a year at Liberty uh, working on something that's now Liberty Charge, but I desperately wanted to get back into uh, doing something on the fiber build side. So uh, I, you know, with what had happened at Sky, uh, it, clearly the market was good. There were some early entrants and uh, I set up Box Broadband at the end of 2018 um, to get uh, fully involved. Some stats before we get into uh, where we are. The, uh, the market now has about, uh, in terms of pure fiber homes, and the numbers are moving fast all the time, but uh, probably about 13 million now. And then if you look at gigabit capable, it's around 21 million. That means that uh, if you look at the cable, net, uh, the cable network that Virgin Media have, and you add that into the mix, that's about 21 million out of 28 million homes. So it's about 75% there. But obviously, even Virgin are pushing to uh, build a, fiber, uh, a fi full fiber network as well. The interesting thing with all of this is that there are still about 5 million homes out there that have uh, less than the universal service obligation. So that's less than 10 meg. And when we first launched the internet, 10 meg sounded a huge amount. Um, Blue Yonder back into 1998 was 500 kilobits, which was you know a step change up from uh, the dial-up modems. But and you know so 10 megabits now has seemed like a colossal speed, but it's not good enough for you know it buffers, it's slow, it's clunky. If you're watching TV, you don't actually get a true 10 megabits through anyway. And some of the areas that we got involved in um, in the rural build that we did, they don't have any more than half a meg of internet, and they've got no 4G. So it's absolutely tragic, and it got even worse during COVID when we were be being begged to build networks. So these are a few slides from Farpoint. You can get hold of this uh, connectivity survey, which they did in January 23. They do a lot of work with the government as well, um, and the regulators, and they, they, they Produce this report. Uh, so uh, we asked where the most progress was seen in 2022 and how the following were ranked. Um, and the top one and the second choice was pretty much all of that was to get uh, more gigabit broadband connectivity out. Even though it's moving at pace, um, it's not going as smoothly in a lot of uh, the 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 not so urban areas. And those are the areas that are desperately calling out for broadband, especially after things like COVID when people are, are now working from home and not working in uh, the main cities. Um, and if you look at that as well, there are more areas that still want to be covered by 4G. Forget 5G, there are, you know, there are areas that still don't have a decent mobile signal um, to, to hook into. The other day, um, my Virgin went down actually when I was on some conference calls, but I can just drop straight back and connect my computer through my phone and the conference call work fine so but there you know some parts of the country don't even have that so we asked what the digital connectivity priorities are for 2023 and first and second choice really is still to get as much and this is a fairly broad survey to get more gigabit broadband out there um, and I, the, when you actually when, you, when you're building a company and you're working with the local residents uh, they're pleased you're in area but there's still an aversion to it. They still don't know what they're getting. They still don't know what fiber to the home actually is because everyone says that they're providing fiber. Fiber to the cabinet isn't fiber to the home, but it's still perceived or was until the uh, marketing uh, uh, Ofcom got involved recently and in saying that you know fiber has to be properly fiber if you're gonna call it fiber. So there's there's a, a lack of understanding about what you're actually getting as well when you're being when you've been called by a, a call center or by a provider of services as to whether you're actually getting full fiber or you're just getting fiber to the cabinet. And the second point there is uh, ensuring 100% of premises in the UK have at least super fast. This goes back to, I, that, I've lost the definition of super fast. Is it 30 meg? The universal service obligation is 10 meg. It would be great if everyone had at least 30 meg. That would be fantastic. But that's not going to happen um, unless the rural areas are really attacked. And that's part of what the um, the uh, the grant early grant vouchers um, 
of the grant subsidy that the government wanted to put out there was was there to cover. Um, and you know, even smaller amounts, more areas covered by 5G. So 4G and more broadband is absolutely what's required out, out in the networks. Um, and then this is going into actual organizations. We asked about uh, how digital connectivity is viewed within an organization and whether it's a key enabler. Um, and you know, once again, strongly agree and agree to the, I won't go through all of these, but digital infrastructure plays a fundamental role in enabling the re region to remain competitive. When COVID happened and everyone uh, ended up not being able to travel, uh, all of these industries, there's a lot of industries that got set up. People set up consultancy firms, people set up media companies, people were working out, um, out of the city. And uh, it, it, it's taken a long time to get people to want to travel back in. It was a change in lifestyle, uh, video conferencing and things like that. So, you know, even small companies, small medium businesses, they, they don't have everyone back in the, uh, the big city centers anymore. So they absolutely want it's a lot of small organizations that we provided at Box Broadband. Uh, <coughs> connectivity too. They absolutely needed it. They, you know, they they really wanted a gigabit connection, and they can get it at a good price. You can buy a gig connection um, for a little bit more than you can. You know, they, they would choose a retail consumer connection for wanting to pay sixty quid, but actually, you, you wanted to push them up into maybe a hundred pounds for a gig connection and a more carrier grade um, SLA around that. But it was still a very cost effective way. An example of that is. There was one school that we uh, we served down in the Surrey Hills, and they had a um, hundred meg circuit in uh, from BT, which they'd paid about a couple of hundred thousand pounds for to have put in because the fibre run had to be put into the school. We ended up putting a backup line of one gig into that um, for. Yeah, a, a couple of hundred pounds a month. So it was transformational for them and actually the BT circuit that they'd paid a lot of money for, albeit 10 years ago. So it was it was a desired circuit at the time, had been massively superseded. Uh, they'd got their use out of it. But, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the ability to provide uh, these services all to small, medium enterprise and also mid-sized enterprise is absolutely key. I won't go through all the rest. I'll just touch on the last one. My organization does not see digital infrastructure deployment as a priority for the region. So that's just disagree and strongly disagree. So it shows the uh, the reason for having uh, or the, the, the need to have fiber. And it's not just because it's a buzzword um, and uh, you know it's, it's the new, new thing. It is because it's absolutely needed with everything that's going on. So I'm going to try something. We're going to try and switch to a video, which... Uh, which you might find, you might even remember. It goes back to about 15 years ago. It's a Heineken advert from YouTube. Hey, what well, you've got that open, we could lay our new gas main in it. What a good idea. That would save digging a road up again and causing the public more inconvenience. Excuse me, mate. You won't mind if we stuck the cable in there at the same time, would you? The more the merrier. I've got a phone line. Anyone else? How refreshing. How Heineken. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. Very good ad. I can honestly say Hello. that that is not what's happening out there. Um, it is like the Wild West. And uh, if we go to the next slide, this is one of the frustrations that uh, anyone that's seeing network being built around them is now facing because an alt provider or open reach will be in an area. And then a couple of months later, another alt provider comes into that area. And there's no coordination um, anymore. It's not like the cable industry where things were franchised, so uh, which was a nice way of doing it. You'd build an area, and there was about 30 or 40 cable operators in the early days, and then when consolidation happened, you would buy the neighboring areas, you know, they would cons a cable operator would consolidate around them. And you know, apart from IT systems and looking at the fact that the networks were maybe architected differently at, a, a, at an RF level, um, the, it was easy to integrate. There's now 150 fiber providers. And in one of the areas that we were building in Cranley, which was the first area the Box Broadband built in, there was four or five operators when I stepped down as CEO. And it's because it's a big, dense rural area and everyone wanted a bit of it. And I, I remember chatting to one of the other all, all providers. I won't, I won't say the name. They're in there now. And I said, look, you know, we've already built it. Why do you want to come in there to the CEO? And he said, because it was agreed with our investors 18 months ago and closed the money and we're not going to change our build program now we're going to build uh, Cranley you can either sell it to us <coughs> or we'll 
you know, we'll take you on in area and see who wins. And well, they were the second. There's now been a third and a fourth. And it's crazy. And the good thing was, PIA was so bad in Cranley, I think all the other operators felt they'd just pop in and ride behind the fact that we'd unblocked everything, but we actually built our own network. So it's quite nice to see them struggling. I say that in a... Uh, in a, uh, I don't want to be bitter way, but there's no need to keep overbuilding everyone. So, uh, and if we look at some of these availability of service, um, there is plenty of build going on, but uh, there's also plenty of overbuild, which means those that aren't being built are going, well, why the heck is no one building my area? Why, you know, why is all that activity going on there? Um, affordability of service. The affordability of service <clears throat> has changed dramatically in the last two years and what's driven that has been overbuilt. So you build an area, you think you're first in, you're offering a gigabit service. It's, you know, these, the, the, the areas that we're building are having something very transformational. And then someone else comes in and you're in a price war now and you're offering discounts, uh, you know, six month discounts, nine month discounts, promos and your ARPU's coming down and, you know, the residents are winning and that's fantastic, but it's, it's too early for the price erosion that's happening when actually the costs of building these networks are you know, incredibly high. When you start building uh, or you take any money in at all, there, there are three metrics that you get asked constantly. Cost per premise passed, cost per premise connected, and then if you start to get a take up of customers and you start to build up um, a customer base, then you can start to look at the true cost of acquisition as well. But that's that's something that you can only really get any sense of when you've actually started to get uh, a decent take up and understand what that, that looks like. But cost of connecting customers, the cost of an installation and the cost of passing a home are absolutely key. And the cost of connecting a customer goes up significantly if you are only getting less than 10% take up because that, that uh, sorry, the cost of connecting a home, uh, the CPP, uh, so you, you look at the cost of building a home, but if you only got one in 10 take up, then the, the cost of actually building to that one customer, if you got 10% take up is 10 times the cost. So let's say it's 500 pounds cost per premise pass, but you get 10% take up, that's 5,000 pounds spent on that first property, plus the connection cost, plus the marketing cost. Uh, you know, the, uh, the idea is that, you know, the companies now that are building these networks really need to be driving up take up. So the costs are coming down, um, which is absolutely fine. Um, lack of digital skills, um, it's, it, it, it's, it's important. A lot of the areas that we started building in offered, uh, um, we, we would go into the community centres and we'd put in PCs and we'd have evening classes with uh, local uh, representatives to teach people what the benefits of fibre were. Um, and that's, that, that, that helps to overcome. And it's not an age group thing. It's just, you know, people didn't know what fibre meant and what, what else you could do with it. Um, and also wanted to, you know, those that weren't using the internet as it, as it should be used, um, you know, we could, we could train them up on how to use it, uh, especially when you're running a business from home. So helping the community was absolutely key. That's, that's the end of the, uh, the stats, but it shows you know, where, the, where the industry is and where the industry is moving to at the moment. So when did this all start? I think uh, 2013, 2012 were when Gigabit and Hyperoptic um, and City Fibre were really uh, starting to build um, small amounts of network in the UK. There were, and it was quite interesting, um, there were early government subsidies for building fibre and you know, BT is a very good company, uh, and, but it will always protect its territory. So what was happening, and I remember these being in the paper with GigaClear, they'd get awarded Ox Oxfordshire, for instance, and you know, a build of uh, 40 million uh, pounds to build an area, and then OpenReach would go, well, to be fair, we said we weren't, but we now want to build that area. So you really can't offer a subsidy because if we're in that area, um, you know, all you're doing is stimulating competition. So, and you know, it, it became a little bit messy. Ofcom were very frustrated with how these grants were being allocated and then contested. Um, and then, in the in, in the elections around 2019, Boris Johnson uh, said that he was going to put five billion into ensuring all areas get at least super fast broadband. Um, so that was fibre rollout everywhere, including the universal service obligation. And it meant that the, the grant program changed significantly. Um, when we set up Box Broadband, there was a grant allocation for every customer you connected to a gigabit connection, regardless of where they were, whether it was inner city or it was rural. In around 2019, the grant process changed. The government thought, okay, well, 
What's happening now in London is we've got city fiber, we've got community fiber, we've got GigaClear, we've got hyperoptic. They're all building, and we don't really want to be stimulating competition. And Virgin Media are also there. The, the idea of the grants is to, you know, to, to offer a gap subsidy to areas that do that aren't going to get built. This outside in program was to build the 20% that was going to be last, get them built sooner, and it was a good thing. Um, so they changed the grant scheme. They had a rural gigabit connectivity voucher scheme, £500 for a residential customer, £1,500 for a, a, a business customer or small and medium business. But it wasn't just, here's the money for building. You actually then had to, you know, the PRP process that you had to go through, that, uh, which is what it was called, submitting bill plans, submitting bill costs, submitting OPEX um, costs was quite, uh, quite tough. And then each area had to be approved for a grant. And then you wouldn't necessarily get the full amount. It was a subsidy. So if your network cost you £800 per customer to build, when a typical network is, you know, with good PIA and lots of overhead is about £400, they'll look at that and go, okay, so we'll give you £400 subsidy for those. So it helped to bring the cost down of delivering that, you know, on the outside in program. Um, and then in 2018, 2019, 2020, with all this rhetoric about huge amounts of money being chucked in, lots of people thought, fantastic, gold in the hills, we'll set up a company and start building networks. Um, so the number of entrants from 1920 and past that went from when, I, when we started Box, which was about 20 companies, to 150 that there are now um, and the problems that we now face. The next slide looks a little bit at what we what we had to go through. So uh, you know, you you get the first round of funding. We we raised three million um, in our quite quickly with high net worth investors, and it was fantastic. You know, it allowed us to put in a, a data center, a Juniper core. Worked with Nokia for all of our um, optical electronics, putting in street cabinets, getting a core team. You know, people were multitasked. Person in HR was also doing um, monthly billing with the few customers that we had. Um, but we put in some systems, having launched several internet uh, services, including you know, in the cable industry, open source spreadsheets. All worked absolutely fine. We secured a yard. We had all of our equipment delivered to the yard for storage, uh, a lockup, uh, a couple of bill contractors, um, and outsourced network planning. And that's something I'll come to because that's absolutely key. It's the crown jewels of uh, a company as it's scaling up customer service, uh, you know, engineering, writing, you know, um, on, on the website, uh, customer care, you know, wh what you can expect with your router. Um, you know, so everything was done. Every, everyone was multitasking. The people that were rolling the network out were all running the knot we're also updating the website and uh, you know it, it, it was all it was all brilliant it was it was a good time to be doing it uh, you know getting some vans a few cherry pickers to put some overhead cable in um, PIA uh, we've talked about extensively this morning um, and the challenges with that getting on the PIA was transformational um, in the way that we could build but as we were a rural builder um, not everything was brilliant uh, PIA and we had to do a lot of our own traditional bid and then uh, being involved in the DCMS PIA PRP process. I mean, we only had about 15 people in the company, and this is what we were doing, plus some outsourced partners. Um, but the idea was get an operating model, show that we could get the grants from DCMS, get the network built, uh, show that we could uh, sign up customers, show that we were generating revenue, show that we were... <coughs> Uh, um, take it, driving up, uh, take up in the areas that we were building. At that point in time, there weren't any, uh, there wasn't too much overbuild, um, and just having this nice ecosystem that was ready for our principal round of funding, um, and that was fantastic. It took us to early 2020. 2020, I had four investors. Um, that all wanted to invest in us because we were building rural. Um, we were, we had a, a model that looked great. For some of the investors, there were telecoms companies that wanted to invest in as well because we were doing rural and they weren't doing rural and we had that process um, locked down. And you know, when we were putting in the submissions, each submission was going through really quickly with DCMS, even though they were overloaded. So we had we had a, we had a good model. Fantastic. Two banks, two telecoms companies, close our big round of funding to get us to two hundred thousand homes, about a hundred million pounds, and then COVID hit, and uh, it kind of took us completely by surprise. Uh, and the lockdown um, that, uh, that ensued meant that uh, I had to uh, get rid of my sales team um, because we, weren't, we, we actually couldn't 
um, connect customers unless you had a hazmat suit on. No one wanted you on their door. In fact, when I used to drive to Cranley, where our offices were um, during COVID, I was probably the only one on the A3. We were allowed to carry on doing bits and pieces because we were a utility company or perceived as a utility company, but there was no one around. It was completely empty. And I was thinking, crikey, how am I going to keep the company going? We've got about six months of money. We've got a small company. No more build. Can't do any build. And then... Um, as we went through COVID, um, I thought, if we don't do any build, we're not going to be able to get the grant. And uh, during this, there was, a, there was a break during the first COVID, between the first COVID and the second COVID. And we went back out there. And this is, this is actually me working with some ground workers and our construction director. And we thought, if we can just get this fibre laid through this field, which was about a kilometre and a half that allowed us to connect a new community that we'd built, but we hadn't taken them back to our cabinet, then we can get the grants. It was completely residential. Uh, it was completely rural. Um, and there was 80 homes there. And we'd had the grant award for that area of 80 homes. Everyone had signed up. And everyone was a £1,500 grant because of the difficulty of building it. So 80 times 1500 another £120,000. That will keep us going um, a little bit longer while we, we sit out COVID. Um, so I was out, I was out four or five in the morning, you know, just digging and laying fibre. And the problem with this is the far farmer wanted us to dig the fibre a metre down, which is a long way. And you don't, it, it was just very painful. It was also tipping down with rain. The, digger kept sliding into the ditch and uh, we got it done um, and we got those customers connected and actually it was a really good thing because when the second COVID happened it wasn't as brutal and we went back out for our round of funding but what was even better was we were connecting customers and we were getting those grants in so the second round of funding was uh, <clears throat> was even better for us. We had a couple of other companies that were interested in funding us, one of which was um, Deutsche Telekom um, and uh, Deutsche Telekom, um, DTCP Community Partners and Warburg Pincus, which were the backers of um, uh, Community Fibre. So we now had five companies that were quite keen in us, which was a nice position to be in. Um, but uh, it, uh, it, it took six or seven months, so we had to keep pushing um, to, to try and attract more customers. Bit of sunshine there. This was taken in 2000 and, uh, late 2019. Trying to build up the brand. Really terrible flyer designed by me and one of our engineering team. Never get engineering to design a flyer. I don't mean that badly, but um, it's, uh, it was great. It, it served a purpose. We were popping these through doors. We were holding uh, fairs. And, you know, we were getting people signing up in Cranley and the surrounding areas, but we could only build so much. So then that, that creates quite a lot of... Uh, problems because we haven't built everyone's home in Cranley and obviously people are coming to these events from you know a little bit further afield so there's a lot of pressure on us um that's what the early days of uh you know actually having to be visible out there walking the streets and uh, uh, you know trying to build up box broadband it was a brand new brand no one knew who we were did anyone trust us to put fiber into their home then you go and get money um a lot of money spent on sales and marketing and you know 18 months later this is what our marketing looks like as a company and it is fantastic and you know this is outsourced to agencies we went from 15 people in the company to 110 in the first 18 months but that was all very necessary uh, things like uh, bringing the mapping in-house and actually knowing where we wanted to build and understanding the cost of those builds given that there are a lot of other companies coming into those areas so a lot changed with funding but I look at this and I think you know what will you unbox working with creative agencies we were putting out ads every two weeks on all the social media channels. It's fantastic. It's a world uh, that I, you know, haven't really been involved in, but, I, you know, this whole world of uh, social media advertising, it's very much a younger person's um, game. People are coming out of university that have done marketing degrees now, and the tools that they use for, you know, profiling the AI tools to understand who's opened, who's looked, who's placed an order. It's it's completely different set of uh, systems and tools that you need as a company if you want to be reactive and stay on top of the competition. So we raised the money, and that was fantastic. Gave us a uh, a, a uh, the chance to uh, to do what we needed to do, which was to build both uh, urban and rural. So we we had about a a seventy thirty split. Continue building rural, working with the government, getting the grants in, but. Uh, for the, for the amount of money and the, uh, the build that we had to achieve in three years, it was never going to happen with rural because the DCMS process is quite, uh, even though we were 
uh, slick at putting the, 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 uh, the grant awards in, they, they still took a month or two to adjudicate them. So we needed to get out of building rural and we moved into a lot of urban areas across Surrey, um, the uh, East Sussex and West Sussex. Uh, and those, as you, as you scale up your build, as you scale up your uh, mapping tools, your GIS tools, uh, you need better systems. You cannot carry on uh, working, you know, with spreadsheets um, or, you know, uh, Microsoft Excel so we, and, and open source. Things needed to be tied together. That mapping system needed to feed the CRM platform so you knew the as-built was ready to go live and it had been tested, that could feed the CRM. So when we would call into the call center, someone could take an order, have a look and know that that customer could actually go live because trust pilot scores really matter. And if you don't do an install when you say you're gonna do it, the news groups kick off and uh, it's, it's really important, especially with the competition coming in. So we, we, we started to join up systems. Uh, we didn't need all singing, all dancing because you're still going through this growth journey, but uh, yeah, we, we, we needed to make it uh, more operationally efficient. We put in six build partners because we were building across three counties now and those build partners were all expert a lot of them had done open reach PIA builds so they were they were great for us and they also had the traditional build side of things as well um, so that said open reach don't just go fantastic um, that's that competition's great um, there's been a lot of challenges to building out as an all provider not just because other all providers are building over us um, and prices are coming down, but we've obviously got the challenges of uh, BT, uh, Openreach, Equinox pricing, bringing down um, the, uh, the cost of taking, providing services to the likes of Sky and TalkTalk, Talk, those that take um, the, the Copper Loop and the FTTC and now the FTTP services off them. So that's, that's, that's been scrutinized heavily by Ofcom, um, but uh, the first Equinox pricing went through uh, relatively unscathed, despite Inca, the uh, the body for 150 alt providers, contesting it and suggesting that it might be um, a little bit a uh, little bit too uh, uh, too anti-competitive. It didn't happen. So Equinox Two has just come out. Um, that looked like it was going to go through until Philip Jansen recently said that there's it's all going to end in tears for the alt providers and there's only going to be one player in this in this field and that that was looked at as being quite an anti-competitive statement so uh, equinox 2 is now being looked at a little bit uh, with, with a little bit more scrutiny than uh, than was originally expected which is good um, once again it's it, it, it's it's good for the uh, the cable uh, sorry it's good for the uh, for the alt providers but the challenges aren't just from open reach, they are from the fact that we're all uh, uh, overbuilding each other. The other thing is customer service. Um, you, you know, you, you put in this router and a lot of people have got no idea what having a gigabit actually means. And I was having this conversation with John last night about why people need a, a gigabit, but people want to pay for a premium service. So we've got about 30% 30, 30 on gig, 30% and 300 meg, and uh, I don't know, whatever that leaves, 40% on uh, split, on the, uh, on the 100 meg uh, package that we offer. And people that had half a meg and no, um, no telephony were still going straight for a, um, a gig service because actually our gig at 59.95 wasn't too much of a jump from the fact that they were paying 49.95 for broadband and phone um, from another provider. So they'll just, why not go right at the top end and experience this ridiculous speed? Um, but they don't know what to do with it. And that, 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 that's because there's a level of education. We would, I would go out to a lot of customer service visits and they'd go, well, I've, I've got a router. But I can't get uh, I can't get a gig in that room up there. Well, that room you got a big house, um, and that 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 that's not going to happen. Um, why can't I get it on my mobile? Well, if you look at the spec on your mobile, it says that it's got a 300 meg interface, so you're never going to get a gig on that. So you know you start having to um, really assist customers because trust pilot's important. You want positive feedback. So we then set up a customer excellence team, which was a post install team, which would go out to any customer across all of our build area and make sure that they were truly satisfied. And we would sit there and we'd do Wi-Fi tests with them and talk them through what they needed and we'd sell Wi-Fi extenders or recommend Wi-Fi extenders for them <coughs> because that is the only way to keep customers when the competition um, is so tough. And then 
when you're going through all these um, social media channels and you're marketing to 40, 50, 60,000 homes, um, pushing these adverts out, the, the leads come in, but those leads have to be converted. So you get this very broad funnel. And then by the time you get to the ones that have actually signed up for the service, you've got a very small number, maybe 10% of those leads that come in from all the social media marketing um, that you're doing. So it's, it's keeping on top of that as well. It sells marketing, um, post uh, post drops, everything through the Royal Mail. Uh, you've really got to be out there, but you've got to be able to support the service as well. You've got to know that the GIS mapping is up to date so that you can actually connect these customers. Trust Pilot is really, really important um, as a metric in area. And it's something that we, we, we had a score of about 4.8. It dropped down uh, because we were, we were building, but we weren't uh, releasing the areas quick enough. People were getting frustrated, saying that Box and Neving are connectors. They look like they've been in the area for six months now. Why have we not got the service? So you start to, you know, it, it just it becomes organic in the uh, the news groups. But it's something to really um, keep an eye on as an operator. It's something that, you know, so this this whole scaling up was a, was was a big challenge. And working with brand new marketing agencies and the tools that they use, as I said, they, it were things that we had never actually had to do before. But the the key still was cost per premise passed, cost per premise connected, and cost of acquisition. What was happening, um, and so the, 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 the pressures on the company, when the war happened, the cost of money went up. Um, the cost of money's gone up, so you've got an equity debt split for the fundraising. The, the debt side of it is now very much more expensive, but your ARPU's coming down. Um, and the business cases are just not what they look like three or four years ago. Things have fundamentally changed. Um, and there are a lot of investment companies that have put a lot of money into a lot of companies and now wondering whether they're going to achieve the targets in the business case. Business cases are being adjusted um, accordingly. Customer take-ups not, not quite as high as it was expected to be the, uh, the, the revenues from voice. We, in, we even introduced TV service uh, because uh, we found out that TalkTalk Talk, we're going to introduce a t the same TV service. And it's not that we needed a TV service. It's just that we didn't want to not have a TV service because it's, uh, it's another marketing um, uh, product to, uh, to show that we could actually do a triple play. So all of that's happening, and you're, uh, you're always looking at the next round of funding. And although we ended up with a commitment to build um, a couple of hundred thousand homes, it wasn't all just stuck in our bank account in one go. Um, there's lots of drawdown tranches and lots of drawdown challenges and reviewing the business case. Um, so we we went through two rounds of funding until I, until I stepped down, the last round of funding, I, I, I stepped down just after. And it set the company up to, uh, to for a very, very good 2023. Apart from the fact that uh, this is what the market looks like now. And I use the term further down, it's like the Wild West, and I'll get to that, but uh, it's become crazy out there. Um, so what's, what's happened is 150 all providers, and if you read ISP Review, which I look at every morning to see what's going on in the, the world of uh, fiber and broadband, um, every one of those 150 providers has said that they've got funding to build 100 million, uh, sorry, 100, uh, uh, a million, sorry, that shouldn't be a... Uh, Every single one of them has said that they're going to have got funding to build a million homes. So 150 providers, and uh, each one's going to build 100 home, uh, a sorry, a million homes. That's 150 million homes. There's, there's not that many. There's 30 million homes in the UK. So um, there's, there's clearly, uh, that's clearly not going to happen. And everyone has also um, secured gazillions of uh, pounds in funding, which also isn't true. The, this money is put in in a very drawdown um, factor, uh, manner, and it means that there's going to be a lot of, uh, lot of casualties in the industry. There's too many operators. Um, as I said, the overbuild and the ARPU uh, is, is impactful. Um, and so, so what does that mean? Consolidation has started to happen. So if you look at Fern Capital recently, they decided the first part of the consolidation was they've got to get the companies that they own 
consolidated. And it seems like a sensible thing. You've got 20, 30 uh, P firms that have funded this and they, you know, they've got two or three each. So that would be a sensible thing to do to help bring it down because 150 all providers is 150 CEOs, is 150 COOs, is 150 sales directors. It's a ridiculous amount of money that's been put in at an OPEX level that could be brought down. So I think that uh, you know, we'll start to see consolidation with the, uh, within the investment community. <clears throat> but it has to happen. The, uh, we, we, uh, we, we talked about PIA and what was going on with PIA this morning. One of the things that we were seeing in area, and it, it, it's absolutely crazy, is that we would build an area and then an operator would come in that was adjacent to us that wanted to build that area and they would have taken our kit down off poles and left it hanging and their kit's now up on poles. Or the first thing you do when you're building, um, because the ducts are congested and everyone wants to use the open reach infrastructure, is you have to test rod and rope, which means that you have to try and unblock it and pull your ducts through. Then you label your duct and then eventually some people will come along and blow the fiber in. So it's kind of staged, test rod and rope, pull your subduct in, put the fiber in, then get the splices in. It's kind of at a 20,000 foot level, that's how the build happens. And then, uh, and you've got kit on poles and you've got kit in chambers. Our duct was being taken out so the next provider could pull their duct in. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually criminal acts because it's removal of uh, uh, utilities infrastructure, but that's what was happening. And I'd phone up other CEOs and say, look, you know, your guys are in our area and this is all your guys or girls are in our area. This is what's happening. This is what's happening at the coalface. I think it is. Actually, if you look at the uh, PIA NOI's notice of intent, you were the ones that were in there yesterday. And here's a picture of our pole two days ago uh, with our kit on the top. And here's a picture now with our kit hanging down. And, uh, you know, your kit suddenly at the top. So it really was getting like it, it is. It's like the Wild West out there. Um, and we've had build crews saying that they've almost come to blows with another build company that's in the area. Because the supply chain, there's so much pressure on the supply chains. We've got so many homes to build for such a cost and so many customers to connect. So our build partners have got so many homes to build at such a cost. And they, if they've got someone else in there doing exactly the same thing in exactly the same area, it's, it's going to lead to blows. And that's exactly what's happening. So the pressure goes all the way through um, the supply chain. Uh, and so unless consolidation starts to happen and you take out someone that is adjacent to you, absorb that infrastructure, even though it may already have some build, it's going to stop the fact that uh, you, can, you can then own that area, stop the prices being driven down. Um, so the consolidation actually does need to happen. It is starting to happen. I think 2023, when I was at uh, the INCRA event last year, was supposed to be the year where it's going to kick off. And, you know, there's, there's tentative moves. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a bid in for um, City Fibre at the moment. Whether that will happen or not is quite a, quite a big play. Truly are uh, looking like they're up for sale. Um, and then there's um, up in the Midlands that uh, obviously have to be sold because of the Russian investment. So there's th th these stimuluses also get PE firms looking at it and going, okay, well, if we're going to take them out, why don't, we, why don't we look at securing some other properties around those areas as well, some other operators around those areas. So I think this year and next year are going to be key for consolidation. I think uh, the private equity companies are going to be pushing really hard. It's going to get quite brutal. If you haven't hit your take-up numbers, when we started, it was a land grab. You had to be building quickly and fast now it's changed to you have to be able to monetize that network because if you can't get the customers what a waste of money for that uh, that investment firm um, so it's it's the model has changed significantly um, to to moving towards monetization and if you can monetize your network you might stand a chance of getting a half decent price when you come to be consolidated so that's uh, that's a big push I think I've covered most of these now actually I do think that there's going to be some casualties. There's some companies that are just going to fundamentally run out of money now. And I look at the, I look at the industry as um, there's a lot of companies that are kind of building up to about 20,000 homes that are going to struggle because they probably haven't taken um, the, uh, the number of customers on board that they should have done in that build. Then you've got the kind of 20 to 100,000 homes that the mid-sized companies like Box and many others fit into where you've had the investment, luckily, um, and your drawdown tranches will be challenged. But actually you've still got commitment and you're still moving forward and then you've got the big players at the top end that do need you know hundreds of millions of pounds um, and where the consolidation uh, should begin looking back down across the smaller operators so that's 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 <laughs> that's the journey that we've been on it's been uh, quite a challenge it's been enjoyable um, it's been painful uh, with covid 
uh, in the middle of it, but uh, we're still standing. And you know, Box is one of the you know one of the 150 companies that uh, you know has, has challenged and taken on OpenReach to get the the UK uh, built and up and running. And it is a good thing because actually OpenReach is building uh, fast now. Virgin are f building fast. And what it looks like from the potential acquisition of uh, City Fibre is that the the government and even the CMA see that there should be three companies left at the end of this. Obviously, OpenReach, obviously Virgin, and then potentially somehow patching together all of these fiber providers so that there is a third wholesale network in the UK, um, which would be great, but I can't see that happening um, anytime soon. So thank you. Any questions? <laughs>